whenever you are into any Oracle DBA interview, it's not an interrogation. It's an interview. Interview is a healthy discussion so that you define whether the employer is a good fit for you and employer defines whether the employee is a good fit for the company. Welcome back guys, Arun this side once again with the another episode of Daily DBA Show. I'm excited as usual. I have five new questions and these questions are related to, I think some of them are related to performance tuning. I am loving these questions and let us start with the first question of the day. How flashback works for multi-tenant architecture? Like if I have two PDBs named HR and sales inside a single CDB, and I am performing any change release in either of PDB and due to some failure, I need to revert changes to original state. Before changes, how will it work? So guys, let us understand the way Flashback works in a normal database, like standalone database, probably it's 11G version. So in 11G version, let's say you want to go back in time. So you have Flashback database. So you just Flashback the entire database and it goes back at a particular time or at a particular SCN. But for that, you need to enable the flashback at database level. So if you do not enable the flashback at database level, you cannot travel back in time. Fair enough, very simple, right? And also how long or how far back in time you can go depends on the flashback retention target parameter. Now, generally the parameter is for 24 hours. You can increase it and depending on that parameter, you can go that much time back in the past, right? Or you can say it like you can take the database back in time to whatever time you want in the past, right? Now understand when it comes to 12C architecture, the multi-tenant architecture, there is a difference. The way flashback works in 12C release one is little different than the way flashback works in 12C release two. Okay. So 12C release one has a different concept. 12C release two has a different concept. The 12C release one has a problem. Like in 12C release one, you cannot actually flashback the PDB right away. Okay. It's not so simple, but you can always flashback the CDB, the root container. So the root container can be flashback in time like a normal database, like your 11G database or any other database, 10G version database. But if you have a PDB and let's take, if you want to take the PDB in 12C release one back in time, then you have to perform ARM and point in time recovery. You cannot perform the flashback PDB concept. I think it's not available in the 12C release one. When it comes to 12C release two, they have introduced this concept of taking PDB back in time and this actually allows the flashback PDB. So in 12C release 2, you have both flashback enabled at root level, that is CDB level, and you also have flashback that is enabled at the PDB level. So you can take back root container back in time. You can also flashback the PDB back in time. That's the difference between 12C release 1 and release 2. Remember guys, also 12C release 2 introduced a concept of local undo. So if you have local undo enabled, then you can take the PDB back in time using the flashback PDB command. Comparatively in 12C release one, you don't have such feature. So I think Oracle has improved in 12C release two. So depending on whatever version of the database that you're using currently, whether it is 12C release one or release two, I hope these things should help you. So in 12C release one, just to conclude it, 12C release one, you can take the container database back in time using the flashback database, but you don't have any flashback for the PDB level. So if you want to take the PDB back in time, then you have to use ARM and restore recover. All right. That's the only way. But in 12C release two, you have flashback enabled both the root level container level or CDB level and also at PDB level. So you can take or flashback CDB or PDB back in time. All right. That being said, I think that will help you. So let's move on to the next question. How to avoid hard parsing? This is a very interesting question, guys. And to explain this one, I'll actually jump onto the board to explain all of you how you can avoid hard parsing inside the Oracle database. Let's move on. So guys, as you already know, what exactly is hard parsing and soft parsing? 
So if your SQL ID is in the memory, then Oracle will go for soft parsing. But if you have new SQLs that are coming inside the database, then it will go for hard parsing. Now, the biggest thing is how can you avoid hard parsing because hard parsing is a little costly inside the database. So I'm not getting into what exactly is hard parsing, you all know, but I'll talk about how to avoid hard parsing inside the Oracle database. This is very important because you will save a lot of deal when it comes to Oracle database. And also this is one of the methods to improve the application performance and also to improve the database performance. So I will take an example. So let us assume. So first let me talk about what exactly is SQL ID. Okay. So let's take you have an SQL query. So select star from EMP where ID equal to 1001, right? This is one SQL. So for this SQL statement, Oracle will generate an SQL ID, right? So I have another statement which is exactly same where ID is equal to 1002. So this will have a different SQL ID, all right? And the same thing, let's take I have another statement ID is equal to 1003, right? So this has a different SQL ID. So let's assume SQL ID equal to one, SQL ID two, and this is SQL underscore ID three. Just some random examples I'm taking. So these are the SQL IDs for the respective statements. Now assume this, what is the difference between all these statements? The only difference is ID, right? Okay, let's be more specific. The difference is only these values. Right. So for this SQL, which is exactly same, right? This SQL is exactly same. So first time when this SQL runs inside the Oracle database, what happens? Hard parsing will happen, right? So hard parsing will happen for the first time. But understand this, you are using an or you are running an exactly same SQL. You are throwing the same SQL to the Oracle database. But every time the SQL runs, it goes for hard parsing. Understand by looking at these SQL statements, the only thing that is different is the where condition or the ID column, right? So for this, understand if you can convert these two statements into soft parsing, right? Soft parsing. What is the benefit? You are saving a lot of cost onto the Oracle database. But so I mean, that's the goal. Like, how do you achieve this? Like you have SQL statements, which are exactly same. Only the where condition is different for which Oracle will generate different SQL IDs because if any one character or there is a difference in the SQL, Oracle will tend to generate a new SQL ID, right? So how do we avoid this hard parsing? There is a very simple way by using the bind variables. So what are bind variables? Let's take, okay. So this will, okay, this one denotes the parsing type, okay? Now currently the database is doing hard parsing for all these three statements. So how can we move into a concept of reducing the number of hard parsing when the SQL statements are exactly same. So by using the bind variables. So for example, if I say ID is equal to, and I give a number 1001, right? So I'm defining or declaring a variable inside SQL. All right. So now I rewrite these statements. So select star from EMP where ID is equal to and then I am giving this bind variable all right now understand this every time this SQL statement is run let's take the SQL ID for this particular statement that Oracle generates is some two three four five six this is the SQL ID just taking some random number okay so every time the statement is run against the database for the first time, it will go for hard parsing, right? This is H hard parsing, but assume this, 
again the same statement is run against the database so select star from emp where id is equal to id perfect 100% this statement is exactly same as the previous statement so the oracle will go for soft parsing because this statement was already executed and it is available in the memory so this will go for a soft parsing now the benefit is the next time when you run this kind of statement you just change the id variable value to 1002 and you will get the output the same thing goes for the third one select star from emp where id is equal to id and before running this statement what you do is you change the bind variable to 1003 so what is the difference look at this one these three statements are very costly to the oracle database and you as an oracle dba should avoid these kind of statements like you should not go for hard parsing again and again so it's not like you have the same SQL statement and you are going for a hard parsing, hard parsing, hard parsing. No, it should not work like that. As a DBA, it's your responsibility to make sure if a statement is executed or run inside the database, then try to have bind variables. So when you have bind variables inside the database, the benefit is, let's take the same statement runs again inside the database. Oracle thinks that it is exactly same statement. So it will use the previous SQL ID, which is assigned to this first execution, that is the SQL ID. And it will think that the next statements that are coming inside the database are the same SQL. So this way, Oracle will go for a soft parsing. This is one of the methods in order to reduce the hard parsing inside the database, bind variables. This is known as literals. So do not use literals. Like this is something comes while you develop the application or the application developers should know these kind of stuff when dealing with the Oracle database, right? So that being said, guys, this is the simplest way in order to reduce the hard parsing, all right? So let me jump back onto the system. All right, guys, I think that was an amazing example on how to reduce the hard parsing inside the Oracle database. Now, there are also advanced methods like adaptive cursor sharing, and I think it's out of scope of this video. Maybe we'll keep this topic for some other video. And for now, let me share one real time example with all of you. So what happened is while I was working in one of the projects, there was this developer. So when I was working with the developer, I told specifically that only the where clause in the SQL queries can use the bind variables. And I specified him what is the reason I told him like, uh, you know, it actually impacts the database performance if you are using literals. So it is good that you use the bind variables and it will help speed up the database performance. He did that, okay? But this developer was way smart and what he did, he actually put a bind variable to the column name and the table name also. With that, trust me, it doesn't work like that. So this is a perfect example of overthinking or probably trying to be over smart. So this developer was trying to be over smart. So understand this, when Oracle SQL goes for the execution inside the Oracle database, so the optimizer needs the column name and the table name even before it can decide whether it should go for hard parsing or soft parsing. So if you are hard coding the application where the column name is also inside a third variable or the table name is also coming from a bind variable, the where clause is also coming from a bind variable, I mean, Oracle will still go for hard parsing. It doesn't work like that. So only the where clause conditions can be into a bind variable, right? So you can use a bind variable for the where clause conditions only. You cannot use bind variables for the column name and the table name. It doesn't work like that. All right, that being said, let's move on to the next question. After installing 11G R2 for rack configuration, why we have compatible.asm equal to 11.2.0 and compatible.rdbms equal to 10.1.0? 
Now these two parameters are very important when it comes to accessing an ASM disk group. Understand this ASM disk group is accessed by two softwares. One is the ASM itself, another one is the Oracle database software, right? So compatible.asm parameter determines the ASM software version, the minimum ASM software version that can access the disk group, right? So in your case, when you say compatible.asm is equal to 11 to 0, that means the ASM software minimum version that can access the disk group is 11 to 0 version, right? Now the same thing goes with the compatible.rdbms parameter. So it determines the minimum version of the Oracle database client. I'll repeat, it determines the minimum version of the Oracle database client software that can access the disk group, all right? So if you have clients which are using like 11G or 10G version of client software, Oracle client software, right? So they are trying to connect to your maybe rack environment or the ASM disks. So that client software minimum version can be of 10G or 10.1 release in your case, right? So that means in your environment, your rack setup is allowing the ASM software release that can use the disk group is 11G R2, but you are also saying that the database software client can be minimum version 10G release one and above. So any client software that is 10G release one or above can access this disk group. One important thing, do not set the compatible.rdbms parameter to a higher version until unless you are 100% sure that all the Oracle client softwares are also of 11G version. For example, in your case, let's take you have clients which are using the 10G version of Oracle client software. Now, if they try to access the database, your rack environment, they will not be able to access the disk group and they will get an error because this parameter, if once you set or once you increase this parameter to probably 11G, probably 11G version, then you cannot go back, right? So this is very important for you. So in your environment, if you are sure that your clients are still using the 10G version of the Oracle client software, then you don't need to worry about it. It's just that anyone who is using 10G version one or 10G release one and above client software version, they can access the ASM disk group, right? Pretty simple and straightforward, no overthinking allowed. All right, guys. So let's move on to the next question that we have. What is FAL client and FAL server. What's their purpose? First of all, FAL means fetch archive log. So FAL client parameter is not in use. I think from 11G version, 11G release to version, it is of no use. So you just have to specify the FAL server parameter. So what is fetch archive log server parameter? Dead simple. I'll keep it as simple as possible. So you have a primary site, you have a standby site. For standby, file server would be the primary. For primary, the file server would be standby. Fetch archive log, what exactly does it mean? So if the standby server is having an issue with the archive logs, there is a gap. So there is a gap and some archive logs are missing. So we are telling standby that the TNS entry that we set under file server, go to this server and get the archive logs. All right, so now why this parameter becomes more important in a data guard environment? Assume this, you have one primary site, right? So you have multiple standby. So let's take you have three standbys. So for all the three standbys, the file server would be the primary server, right? This is real important guys, pay attention. So like you have first standby, second standby and third standby. So for the first standby, the file server would be the primary. For the second standby, the file server would again be the primary. For the third standby, again the file server would be the primary. So that way we define that if any of the standby has a log archive gap, then we are telling from where they will get those respective archive logs. It is a good way to determine like you have a streamlined setup in your data guard environment as to from where the servers should get the archive logs. Very simple, file server, file client not being used. 
and file server is the only parameter you need to define. So for any data card configuration, so for primary side, the file server would be the standby. For the standby side, file server would be the primary. And you have to use the TNS entries of the opposite servers. Very simple, straightforward. Now you might have a question like, okay, on standby, we are using file server parameter that will get archive logs from the primary. So why are we using this parameter on the primary side? Valid question. Assume this, when you perform a switch over, the primary becomes standby and the standby becomes primary. In that kind of situation, this standby should know from where to get the archive logs, right? So that's why we have to set file server on both the sides. Whether it is primary site or the standby site, you have to set it. And you generally set it in the parameter file, right? Very simple, straightforward. Let's move on to the next question. Can you please help me understand the use of swap? why not i'm here to help you so guys once again i'll use the board to explain this swap what exactly is swap all right let's jump on to the board so guys to understand swap i'll take an example okay and i have used this example many a times now assume that you have a 10 gb file on your system right and you have 4 gb ram so what will happen when you try to read this kind of file into the memory so this memory is not enough to read this kind of file right this is where the swap area comes into picture so you have a swap area inside your operating system and this swap area is generally people try to keep it a big swap area like my personal recommendation i generally keep it for the test virtual machines is 20 gb right so what will happen is this 10 gb file i can read it so this entire 10 gb file will be loaded into swap and from swap i mean the name itself is saying it will swap the file contents with the memory in a very fast manner right so let's say you have the entire 10 gb file over here in the swap it will be loaded so what happens is it will be giving part by part or it will be putting the part of the entire 10 GB file, let's take 2 GB into the memory. So your memory is having 2 GB of your file and you have 2 GB which is left over for OS operations, right? Now, as we also know, whenever there is a user request, the user request is performed only from the RAM. So we have a user who's asking, I think we'll give them uh, name as Tom. So Tom is requesting the file from our operating system. So what will happen? The answer is always given from the memory. The RAM gives the output to the user. So this 2GB is outputted to the user and maybe user is watching this movie, right? This is a movie example. So this 2GB movie is being watched by this user. So while the user is about to end the 2GB of the movie, right immediately the next 2 gb from this swap will be put into the memory this 2 gb will be flushed out and then user will still continue to watch the movie that's how it works so what exactly is a swap it is a area it is a storage area on your hard disk not on the ram ram is separate so swap is a storage area on your hard disk which acts like ram Okay, so what happens is swap plus RAM becomes your like complete memory area. So this acts as a passive memory. All right, of course it is on hard disk, right? This is on hard disk, but the beauty is, let's say you have big files which cannot fit into the memory. They will enter the swap area and from swap the, I mean, operating system will give smaller size of the file to the RAM and from the RAM the output is given to the user very simple straightforward I guess you get the concept that was very simple right I think in Windows swap is known as virtual pages I'm not sure guys just comment below this video if you know what exactly is swap called in Windows operating system but on Linux you call it swap right and also when it comes to oracle database they have their own recommendation as to what swap size it needs minimum on the operating system before you perform the installation now that being said guys let's move on to the most exciting part and that is the bonus question
All right, guys, I'm back. And this one question, which actually I was speaking to one candidate today, and this DBA faced a couple of interviews, and when he was speaking to me, he told me this line: "Like Arun, whenever I'm facing an interview, I'm able to clear one or two rounds of the interviews, but I'm not able to clear further rounds, or I'm not getting any callback from the interviewers. Why is it that?" So I was curious to ask, like, I mean, I personally wanted to know what mistake that guy is making. So what I did, you know, I asked him a couple of questions, and when when I asked him this question, like, how do you perform arm and cloning? And the way he answered was like, first line, I was like, hold up, this is not the way to answer interview questions. So the the kind of like feedback I gave to that. dba is what i want to share it with all of you first of all guys whenever you are into any oracle dba interview it's not an interrogation it's an interview interview is a healthy discussion so that you define whether the employer is a good fit for you and employer defines whether the employee is a good fit for the company all right so interview is not an interrogation that whenever someone asks you a question you directly jump on to the answer i'll stop right here let's go back to the call that i had with the guy so when i asked this question to this dba and i told him like how do you perform arm and cloning and he right away jumped into the answer saying like oh you know what i'll take the parameter file i'll take the backup and i was like hold on i mean you have to ask smart questions to the interviewer that is very critical interview is a discussion not an interrogation where interviewer will ask you the questions and you right away give the answers it does not work like that all right so what is my point let me explain so whenever interviewer asks you a question your duty is not to right away jump on to conclusion and give the answer ask a smart question okay you want to clone the database what is the size of the database which os platform do you have a backup of the database okay and where do you want to clone do you want to clone on the same server or a different server or same operating system where exactly what is the network connectivity between the servers what is the distance between the servers do you have tape backups do you have disk backups think about it guys when you try to ask questions to the interviewer it helps them understand that you have good knowledge about arm and cloning i mean it's not only about arm and cloning it's about any other activity the biggest problem that i have with all the dbas is you right away assume things and try to answer it does not work like that i mean don't assume what is the environment of the interviewer and right away give your answers no stop stop i mean just stop whenever you have a question from the interviewer go ahead and ask smart questions back to them coming back to the same example arm and cloning like uh, you can ask like is there any recovery catalog configured right these are very smart questions where interviewer will feel like oh this candidate knows great deal about arm and cloning and let me jump on to some other question right and that's how you deal with the interviewers interview is a discussion it's not an interrogation don't right away jump into assumptions don't right away give answers to the interviewers stop right there ask brilliant questions probably smart questions and that's the way you impress the interviewers so once again let's take if somebody asks you question like or an interviewer is asking you this question how do you perform the database upgrade i am not going to give you the answer put those answers into the comments this is your dba challenge and i want to see how smart questions you will ask to the interviewer and try to make it a healthy discussion interview is a discussion not an interrogation that being said guys i will see you all in the next episode and i think i'll take a leave for now bye Water is very important. Drink while you are doing database activities. 
if you don't drink what will happen you know your brain will get heated up and your databases will get heated up and then your servers then hard disk then network everything will heat up okay that was good right